I wanted to share something from uh, Mark chapter 10. And if you want to turn there with me, it's a verse that I've read a lot of times, and I have often read it in the same way many times. And one of the things that the Lord uh, just spoke to my heart as I was reading this was um, give people the benefit of the doubt. That's, that's, uh, this is a specific example of the blessing that comes when we give people the benefit of the doubt. I would say it's one of the things I've learned from Bobby just in my uh, uh, life with him and friendship and fellowship with him is I feel he does a great job of that. He gives people the benefit of the doubt. And there's lots of ways that we can interpret different things. Um, but I, I was blessed to see this. If you look with me at um, Mark 10, verse 35, <clears throat> it says, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And uh, he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. And I have uh, thought and I probably even spoken about the danger of, you know, self-exaltation and things like that. And that's probably true and accurate. Um, but what blessed me was uh, to see that maybe their thinking wasn't so wrong, actually. Um, maybe this was a good request. And I was actually challenged. Maybe I ought to pray, Lord, grant that I might sit on your right when you come in glory. Um, and I'd like to just unpack a little bit of, of why I felt that way. I, it's not the only way to interpret the passage, but it blessed me to give them the benefit of the doubt. They are two of the disciples who are close to Jesus. And um, as, as I looked at the context, it struck me that maybe perhaps this is not a um, as bad of a, I, I've often read it and just thought, what, you know, what, um, you know, uh, what a wrong way to think. And I, I could be mistaken. I wanted to look back, if you would look with me at Mark chapter 10, it says, and think about that the disciples are going to ask this, you know, in a, in a moment, um, that Lord grant that we may sit on your right and your left. Um, because it says that the rich young ruler, he wants to inherit life. If you look at verse 17, it says, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and, and asked him and said, teacher, good teacher, what shall I say? What shall I uh, do to inherit eternal life? And um, I was struck. I mean, it's this man runs up to Jesus. He kneels before him. He calls him good. He expresses a desire to inherit eternal life. And Jesus, <coughs> um, he says, uh, you know, one thing you lack. To this one who had obeyed in all these ways, sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and follow me. And then in verse 23, it says, uh, Jesus says, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 26, he said, uh, verse 27, he says, it's impossible for anyone to be saved, but not with God. All things are possible with God. They, the disciples had said, how can anybody be saved? And he says, um, it's only possible to be saved except with God's help. So, and I see here in this example that James and John, if they were watching the situation, they probably said, this guy, if anybody could be saved, it's this guy. You know, he's earnest, he's sincere, he's been obedient. And Jesus tells us, he turns to us and says, it's basically impossible. And I think, and then, and then Peter, I think, gives voice to maybe what they're thinking. He says in verse 28, behold, Lord, we've left everything and followed you. And then Jesus says in verse 29, truly, I say to you, there's no one who's left houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers for my sake and for the gospel's sake, who won't receive a hundred times more. And I can imagine the disciples, you know, James and John, much like Peter may have been thinking, oh, okay, maybe we're, maybe we're good. You know, the rich young ruler may be impossible for him, but maybe we're good. But then Jesus says, uh, verse 31, but many who are first will be last. And then I can imagine James and John going, wait, so maybe we're not okay. Maybe it's also impossible. It was impossible for the rich young ruler. We've given up everything. And you say that there's no one who's given up everything and won't be rewarded. And yet many who are first, it seems like you're talking about us, will be last. Maybe we're not good. And in a way, what I see is that it's impossible for man, even a man who's rich in having given up 
everything and followed the Lord, um, it's impossible for a man to be saved. Impossible. And then Jesus says uh, something that seems unexpected. He says uh, in verse 32, it says they were going up on the road to Jerusalem. Remember all this context, you know, the, which culminates in the question that I tend to criticize. They were going up on the road and Jesus was walking ahead of them. He's just told them it's impossible. It's only possible to be saved with God. And he tells them, uh, verse 33, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and hand him over and they'll mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And um, it seems like they may have been thinking, you know, what hope do we have? If Jesus leaves us, if he said it's only possible with God for us to be saved. The rich young ruler can't be saved and we can't be saved. What hope do we have to be triumphant if Jesus leaves? What hope do we have? That's what I was wondering if they were, what they might have been thinking. And then it comes, they say what? Verse 35, teacher, will you do, before you leave, we know you're the only way. We know it's impossible without you. We know that many who are first will be last. And just like the rich young ruler, we're in danger too. Will you do this? Can you do what you have said only you can do? In a way, it seemed to me as I was reading it, you know, we say, by the way, don't we? The greatest blessing in all of heaven will be what? Nearness to Jesus Christ. The, great, the only gift I want is to be close to him. When What are they saying here? Grant that we might be close to you. Lord, we only want that gift. You've just told us it's absolutely impossible. And then you've told us the only hope we have, you're about to leave. Before you leave, will you assure us it's possible? To me, I wonder, I, I was just convicted as I was um, assuming the best in them. Um, you know, I, I think I may uh, miss out on a little bit of the heart of this prayer because it's it seems arrogant. But as I was reading this with a heart of, you know, generosity, maybe, or a heart of uh, seeking to see the best in others, I felt the Lord say, why don't you pray that too? Why don't you pray, grant that I might be close to you? And that's the kind of prayer that I'd like to pray by God's grace. Lord, I see it's impossible. I see it's absolutely impossible. And Without you, I have no hope. But with you, Lord, I believe that it's possible. And Jesus answers them. He says, if you look with me at verse 42, they've said, how is it possible for us to sit at your, to be near you in your glory? The greatest gift we might experience. And it says in verse 42, it says, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not to be this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be, shall be the slave of all. Don't be mistaken by any exaltation now. I feel like that's what the Lord is saying. Even the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Don't mistake exaltation or exert as or admiration or or uh, you know anything like that as true greatness the only true greatness is if you can be near me in heaven and who should i look for who who may be granted the privilege of sitting on the lord's right and left it's the servants it's the ones who are willing to come underneath that's and jesus points to himself as the primary example the closer you are to me, the more like the more that you will have been conformed to my nature, which is to come underneath others. If you want to know who's going to be close to me in that day, look for the servants. Seek to be one of those. But don't let it snuff out that prayer that says, I want to be close to you. There's a sense in which we can almost have this false humility. where We can say, oh, I can never be close to the Lord, so I won't even ask. And yet... You know, one of the memory verses we memorized a, a few months ago, it says, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5.15 or 15.5 or, or somewhere there. Somebody can mention it if 
you remember exactly, but it says, he died that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him. Why did Jesus Christ die? Or why did he die? That we might live for him. So is it possible to live for him? Dare I say no? I shouldn't say no. When, when the purpose for which he died is that I might no longer live for myself, but live for him. Lord, it's blessedly possible to live all out for Jesus Christ. Why not, by faith, say, Lord, draw me as near to your throne as possible. I don't want to bury my talent. I don't want to be the one, the disciple who said, oh, I know you to be a hard taskmaster. I know it's impossible to get close to you. So I just buried it. You know, I want to say, no, you've given me this deposit of the Holy Spirit. You've given me a pledge of the inheritance. I want to return. I want to be close to you, Lord. Um, not presumptuous, certainly not, not arrogant, but as it says in Hebrews, boldly drawing near to the throne of grace. That's what it says. Maybe we could just end with that verse. <clears throat> because I fear that there, at least for myself, as I examine my own prayer life, I can lack a little bit of that boldness. At the very least, we can we can attribute boldness to James and John, whether it's and, and for me, I want to take a little bit from that. It says in Hebrews 4, verse 16, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, a hundred percent confident that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Why would I be far from the Lord in that day? It's only because I haven't found grace in my time of need. And if I can be assured that I can find grace in my time of need, why can I not be assured, Lord? I want to be close to you. Why not pray with confidence? Let me sit at your right hand. Not because I deserve it, but because you've promised it's possible to live for you. And I see that it's impossible except for your promise. And yet I see your promise, Lord. So I want to, um, I want to really have that hope in my heart. The, you know, as we sing that song, he is not a disappointment. He doesn't. Uh, you know, it, like it says, I think in the book of Isaiah, it says in one place, I didn't say, seek me in vain. I wish I, I had looked up where that was before I thought of it, but I don't remember. I, I can send it out maybe later on WhatsApp, but I didn't say, seek me in a waste place is what he said. I'm not taunting you, you know, and like, like it says elsewhere, when you said, seek my face, your face, O Lord, will I seek. The Lord has called us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. He's called us to proximity to himself. And if we're not careful, we can have holier ideas than God does. We can say, oh, that's not possible. And the way it'll manifest itself in its prayer life, will, our prayer lives will be like those disciples who we hear somebody pleading with the Lord for an intimate relationship, pleading with the Lord for sincerity of devotion. And we go, how dare they pray like that? Like they could really be, you know, we, we wouldn't say it that way, but we can have that little bit of accusation in our heart or, or differently, we can fail to grab a hold of God's promises with full assurance of faith. And I appreciate that in James and John. And I want to learn that lesson from them. Be bold in prayer. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Confident. The Lord doesn't mockingly tell me to seek him. If you seek, if you search for me with all my, all your heart, you will find me is what he says. And I want my prayer life to bear evidence that I truly believe God's word. In that. So I pray the Lord would help me. The Lord would help us all to um, prove his faithfulness by our zeal in drawing as close to him as possible in our life and for, for forever. <laughs>